and we give ourselves to the glory of Christ in this world. Please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12. Matthew 2. Welcome again to all of our guests. We're so happy that you're here this morning. For those watching online, we love you. We miss you. Hope you are well. And as you know, over the past several weeks, we took on about 70 gifts for children uh, at E.R. Martin Elementary School. Children that, that may be in need there. Uh, that's the school right across the street, right across 741. So it's right here in our community. It's our opportunity to reach out and to um, express our love for them, express our desire for their best. And it's not surprising knowing you, but you very quickly picked up all of those gifts. In fact, Tammy A. Brown, who's leading that, couldn't keep up with it all. We, we, um, we covered all the gifts. So thank you so much for your giving. Thank you to Tammy for leading us in that endeavor and all those that manned the table and helped her with that. Uh, this is the perfect time of year to reach out with the love of Christ and with generosity and care for others. So we praise the Lord for the opportunity, and I thank God. We thank God for your generosity. And also, while we're on that note, connected to it, uh, we thank God for the Bible Adventure Club. The Bible Adventure Club uh, is ministering throughout the school year to several of the students at uh, E.R. Martin and um, uh, apparently it's been growing a little bit, so we have more students coming out. We're grateful for that outreach, and it can make a wonderful impact for the gospel in our community and in this world. Well, last week, Doug kicked off our Christmas series that we're calling Child of Promise. We're calling it Child of Promise because of the hope that Jesus brings into our lives. That's right, that's true. But the main reason we're calling it Child of Promise is because this remarkably one-of-a-kind, once-in-a-life, uh, once-in-a-lifetime, or rather once, or I should really say, once in all of human history, this baby that comes to the world has been promised by God far in advance, far in advance. And what God promises, no matter how far in advance, when he promises, he's going to fulfill it. He does. More specifically, in some of the darkest moments of the people of God in the Old Covenant, God promised them, he promised us through them, that a Savior would come in some ultimate package. He promised this in various and wonderful ways, many ways. And one of those promises is that the Savior would be born to a virgin. Doug hit on that last week. That's an amazing miracle. It's part of the truth of Christianity, one of these glorious realities. God broke into the world and disrupted the natural course of things so that a Savior could come to us. And uh, Doug hit on that last week. And another one of those promises that we receive from God, the child of promise, is where that child would come from. Where that child would come from. Now think about that for a moment. Location and navigation are a critical part of our lives. And anyone who has lived before the advent of GPS knows how much it's changed. It's gotten easier in many ways, but maybe not as good in certain ways. See, we used to commit route numbers and street names to memory. We used to know them. And we used to use landmarks to help us when we've arrived or where to turn. And we used to carry around maps when we went on longer trips to make sure we were on the right roads. Now we just plug in an address or we speak the name and up comes the navigation. And the real question is, because all technology fails at some point, right? The real question is when our technology fails, will we know how to get anywhere? Will we even know where we're at in the moment? I just heard about a friend of one of my daughters driving to her own wedding from South Carolina to Illinois. To Illinois. Her fiancé was driving, but he got tired, so they switched. And she then proceeded to drive while he slept five hours in the wrong direction. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's just so great. <laughs> oh, it's so great. Uh, 
location and navigation are kind of a big deal in our lives. We're always trying to find out where we're supposed to be or where we need to get to pick something up or to pick someone up. We're often on a quest in life and we need to arrive in the right spot. And there's no greater quest than this. Find Jesus in Bethlehem so you benefit from the promises of God. Go to Bethlehem. Go there. That's the location. Find Bethlehem because there you're going to benefit from the promises of God. And when we look to Bethlehem, we find Christ's identity validated. We find his identity validated. Identity is a crucial issue. Location is a crucial issue, but so is identity. And people love to pretend they are someone else. Many people are concerned about identity fraud today. Many services to help us deal with identity fraud. One time I was on a tech forum online and someone reached out to me offering support. I was a bit taken aback because I hadn't asked for support, but I was a bit off balance because it seemed official. And when they began asking for info, I realized this is a scam, so I thought, let me play along. And I said, well, you know, would you like my bank account? And they said, yeah, that, that might be helpful. Yeah, send me your bank account number. Oh, okay, would you like my social security number too? And uh, to which they said, yeah, that, that'd be helpful if you could send that along. So then I told the person, look, I know you're a scammer. And then I asked them, aren't you ashamed of yourself? <laughs> and I'm assuming it's a he, because I don't really know, but uh, I asked that. Uh, to my surprise, he wrote something like, I am ashamed of myself. I need help, which I'm assuming was part of the scam, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> I'm sure that's part of the scam. Like he's just trying to extend this thing, so I, I moved on. But point is, there are many scammers, and when it comes to the Savior, we cannot afford to be scammed. Even Jesus himself said, Time will come when people will, when people will say, he's there, he's out there, he's in the wilderness. He Go there, you'll see Jesus there, you'll have an amazing spiritual experience here. Go over there, go over here. And he says, don't do it, don't do it. We need to know the identity of Christ. It needs to be validated. We can't afford to be scammed. And so we look to Matthew chapter 2, the Word of God. And I'm going to read for you verses 1 through 12 now, and we'll be referring back to it. And, and the main idea that we want to get out of this today, which is that he comes from Bethlehem. So Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Ah, so there's a way to validate the identity of the Savior. One of the ways to validate, to credibly identify him is to recognize where in all of the earth, what location will he come from? Where will he arise out of? And we're told by the prophet, you're going to find him in Bethlehem. And that's from the prophet Micah. This is a quote, Matthew's quoting Micah from Ma Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Now, Micah prophesies in the mid to late 8th 
century, or I should say the, uh, yeah, the mid to late 8th century. So about 700 years before the birth of Jesus, 700 plus years before the birth of Jesus. Seven centuries, centuries before the birth of Jesus. And that's, there's really not much debate about the date of the writing of Micah. Scholars recognize that this was written about this time. And the reason they know that is because he's quoted by Jeremiah. Micah's quoted by Jeremiah, which is written later. And this is one of the details in prophecy that is so abundantly clear that it can be traced going forward. There may be some parts of the Old Testament that scholars may debate, or we might believe, which I I think rightly we see the prophecies of the Messiah throughout the Old uh, Testament writings. And and there, there may be times when we're seeing that and other scholars may say, well, that's not really a prophecy about the Savior. Okay, fair enough. But that's not the case here. In other words, when people want to know where the Savior King is going to come from, where He's going to be born, students of the Scriptures can give an answer, and they've been doing so for thousands of years, as we saw in Matthew chapter 2, when the scribes answered Herod and said, He'll be born in Bethlehem. You can study the Scriptures. And you can see he's going to be born in Bethlehem. It's no secret. Messiah is to come from this little town. The Savior comes from there. And how about that? How does Jesus come from Bethlehem? Well, he's born there. He's born there. So how does this affect us? Consider again that this passage in Micah was written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. He's not just any other person born in Bethlehem. Frankly, not that many people, relatively speaking, are born in Bethlehem to begin with over its entire history. But he's not just anyone born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was so small that it was not considered a city of note until long after, long after Israel entered the promised land with, you know, after Moses and then Joshua. And then even though it came to be associated with King David, it was still quite small. So taken together with other prophecies, it is virtually impossible that any other figure could have fulfilled this prophecy. Just consider one of the most famous names in all the earth emanates from the little town of Bethlehem. That is statistically highly improbable let alone one who has claimed to be the Son of God. Now think of this, both King David, think of the improbabilities of this, both King David and King Jesus, two indisputable historical figures, everyone knows existed and affirms they existed, they are famous names throughout the history and of the world and throughout history and throughout geography, famous names They have international renown, and they both come from the same little town that probably never had more than a few hundred people living there at a given time. Maybe at times, maybe a couple thousand, never more than that. Now it has more people than ever. Both of those historical renowned figures come from the little town of Bethlehem. That is simply highly highly unlikely. And if you do not yet believe, if you do not yet believe in God's words of the Scriptures, in Jesus as the Son of God, you have to account uh, for this 700, th- this prophecy that came 700 years before Jesus is born there. Because there's only one who could know that information and make sure it's communicated in such a clear way that the scribes would be able to tell Herod where Messiah is coming from. And that's God. That's God. Sloughing it off isn't really dealing with it, isn't it? Is it? Just ignoring it or brushing it aside, this reality, this fact, isn't dealing with truth. Too often people just brush aside truth 
Because it's inconvenient. It's difficult. I don't want to deal with it. I'll have to change my life. It will affect me. And what God is saying to you right now, he's holding that fact in front of you, prophecy from God through the prophets hundreds of years prior to the birth of Jesus, who we are now proclaiming to you in your hearing by the Holy Spirit of God. You got to deal with that. Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. And he was born in Bethlehem, just like God promised that he would be. Now think about this another way too. Because it's not just a truth that is, has to be dealt with. And yes, it's a truth that's a stumbling block for some. But it's also this amazing love on display and prophecy fulfilled. Why would God bother to tell humans, hey, here's when it's going to happen, or here's where it's going to happen. Why would he bother to do that unless he wanted us to understand? And why would he bring you to this moment so you could hear and come to understand? Isn't that the love of God for everyone hearing this, that you would know his son come to earth as the Savior of the world? Faith in Christ Jesus is not blind. It is very well informed. Blind faith is the kind that rejects God, sees him nowhere, refuses to look at the truth right in front of your eyes. That's blind faith. God is showing you his love by giving you the prophecy of where the Savior would be born and then fulfilling it and leaving no doubt about this event in history. Find Jesus in Bethlehem so you can benefit from the promises of God. Now, second, finding Jesus in Bethlehem reveals Christ as victorious. It reveals Christ. It validates his identity, but it also reveals him as victorious. Now, there are many ways to discipline a child, but sometimes a self-controlled, appropriate spanking fits the situation well. Sometimes it's really the only answer. But if you use a spanking, it's important that parents contextualize the use of what the Bible calls the rod. My father was a very good example here. He was always self-controlled. He never beat me. He never lost control. It was clear that this was a spanking that was applied as discipline to get my attention and to reorient me to the authority of my patriarch, my father, that God had put in my life for my good. And my dad always took the time to tell me that he loved me. His love for me was never in question. And that takes a lot of the sting away. And there's something sort of similar here, but it's also much more serious. We believe at the time of this oracle in Micah 5 that Matthew quotes, in Micah 5, around 700-something B.C., The Assyrians had Jerusalem, we believe at the time of the prophecy, we believe the Assyrians had Jerusalem under siege. And Micah, the prophecy, delivers all kinds of words of God's punishment and wrath on his people for not keeping his law. So God's God's saying, the siege has come upon you. And Micah's prophesying about God's wrath, God's judgment. But at the same time, God does not stay angry with his people forever. He is loving and merciful and wants us to know his salvation. And he gets the attention of his people who are rebellious and far off. And so in the midst of that terrible siege, God sends this prophecy of hope. He's telling his children, I love you. I love you. Pay attention to me. Reorient to me. I love you. You're going in a catastrophic, destructive direction. You're in rebellion to me, but I love you, so I I gather you again. You experience this from me so that you can be reoriented to me. And so in the midst of that terrible siege, God sends that prophecy of hope. These words from Micah chapter 5 are meant to evoke 
certain messages. These are code words that the Israelites would understand. When Micah prophesies these words, they're going to understand what these words mean historically and symbolically and ultimately they're going to understand it. Not, not necessarily in Christ, but they're going to understand God's salvation and that he's for them. And so Micah chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, here's the, uh, here's the passage that Matthew quotes. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. So first, let's take a look at the literal meaning of these words. Bethlehem means house of bread. Beth means house, and the rest of it is bread. And so house of bread. Ephrathah means fruitful. So together, Bethlehem Ephrathah means fruitful house of bread. So provision, food. What do you need to live? You need food. It's life. It's, it's provision for life that is being talked about in the name of this town, abundant life. There's provision. If you're starving, if you're hungry, you go to Bethlehem and you will find bread in the house. And you can see where this is going. Are you hungry spiritually? Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They will be filled. Are you hungry? Are you spiritually hungry? Do you want to know the truth? Do you thirst for God? If you seek after him, you will find him. If you knock, the door will be open to you. When you come to him, when you go to Bethlehem and find Jesus there, you find the full food, you find the bread of heaven, you find the water of life, you find the provision of God in the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. You find God coming to earth to be our Savior. Now in a little while, we're going to come to the Lord's table ourselves and we'll be fed there and all who know him and have turned from sin and have been baptized in his name will join us at these tables. But all who want that provision, all who are hungry for it, you too can turn from your sin. You can believe in the name of Christ Jesus and you can be baptized in his name and then you'll come to these tables with us. You'll come to the house of bread which is fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And so, we see this is a ruler that will come from Bethlehem. The ruler that comes from Bethlehem will be a provider. He will feed you. He will take away your hunger and your thirst forever. You will be satisfied. That's a glorious promise. Now, first was the meaning of the words, but second, when you look at these words up on the screen, you can see that this is code for David. Code for David. Go back a few hundred years before this was written down by Micah. You go back to the time of David, and Israel was on the verge of annihilation from its enemies. It was on the verge of annihilation. They had, uh, they had gotten a king. Their first king was King Saul. We preached through the, the books there of 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, so you already know the story of Saul. Saul left off in a terrible way. He was killed in battle while he was in rebellion against God. And he was defeated by the Philistines, and he left the nation in disarray. They were running away. Then finally, David is made king, and out of the ashes of Israel comes the greatest days that ancient Israel would ever experience. David rises up, and God gives Israel peace and security. He gives Israel might and a future. He gives them large boundaries and all that they need. David was their savior king. That's how God positioned him. Well, where was David born? We talked about this already. David was from Bethlehem. And so when the Israelite thinks of Bethlehem, what what image does that evoke? It evokes for them the image of the Savior King that will come and save God's people while they're in disarray. And so Micah says to the 
people of Israel at his time when they're under siege. And so Matthew ascribed it to Christ Jesus for his gospel. Bethlehem is the place where David was from. That's where he was raised and he learned his skills as a shepherd. He wasn't only born there. David was also anointed as king there. You may remember the story from 1 Samuel 16. Saul is still king and things are bad in Israel and Samuel's the prophet and the judge and and God says, go, stop, stop mourning for Saul and his rebellion against me and how bad things are in Israel. I have a new king. You go, you go, to, um, you go to Bethlehem. You go to the house of Jesse. And when you get there, I'll show you what to do. And, and Samuel says, he says, Saul will skin me alive. He doesn't quite say that. That's my, my words. Basically, he says, I'll, I'll be in trouble with Saul uh, I need another reason to go. And, and, and God says, take, take an animal and you're going to sacrifice there and tell people you're going there to sacrifice. So he goes, gets to Jesse's house. The sons are brought in front of him. God says to Samuel, no, none of those is, is to be king. Samuel says, isn't there another? And Jesse says, yeah, one more. He's out tending the sheep. They bring in David. And God says, that's the one. And Samuel anoints him king in the little town of Bethlehem. And that's where the salvation of God comes to Israel. That's where it begins. So when God sends this message in the midst of their troubles, this message you see up on the screen from Micah 5, and you see there it talks about Bethlehem Ephrathah, God is saying to them, I'm going to save you. I'm going to send a mighty Savior King, a Messiah, an anointed one, not just any ruler, though. Because if you look down here in in that passage, you see something here. It says, from you shall come forth, from Bethlehem shall come forth. For me, one is to be ruler in Israel whose coming forth is from Israel of old. Now, that could mean that it's prophesied from of old, but it could also mean that he is from of old, and it probably means both. In other words, he's from ancient of days. That can only mean one person, that this is God himself. It's not just a human It's the God-man. God himself is going to come and save them. He's like David as a great Savior King, but he's better than David. And he will be victorious. He cannot lose. And that's what God has done in sending his Son, our Lord Jesus, to Christ. He is the victor over sin. Perfect life. David did not have a perfect life, but Christ did have a perfect life. He overcame sin. And then he overcame death. After he died, he rose up again, took up his life, defeated death forever, gives us hope that death can be defeated and that we can live forever in him. That's victory. Jesus casts down the devil in his coronation on the cross and then in his resurrection and exaltation in the ascension up to the throne room of God where he awaits. And he's the victor over the future, over your future and over my future because he will return again and establish his kingdom forever in a way that can never be denied again by the creatures God has made. Do you ever think to yourself, I'm not sure God's in charge. doesn't seem like he can be because this in my life is way out of control. Take a step back. Look at Bethlehem. Go to Bethlehem and see the victor, Jesus the Savior, King over all, born in the little town of Bethlehem. Find Jesus in Bethlehem so you can benefit from the promises of God. When we go to Bethlehem, we find the identity of Christ validated. We see the victory of God in Jesus Christ. But Bethlehem does something else for us too. It teaches teaches us the nature 
of the Savior King. It teaches us his nature. What's his nature? What kind of Lord will Jesus be? What kind of Lord will this, this king born in Bethlehem, coming from Bethlehem, be? Well, let's think about it. Bethlehem lies six miles south of Bethlehem. Now, there was a period of time where Bethlehem had some significance as a military base because of its strategic position south of Jerusalem. Not because of its size, but because of location. But back by the time of Jesus again, it was again just a little town and not really much of a fortress. So even at the time of prophecy prior to that, 700 years, it was known as a small and humble thing. And you see that again in the passage of Micah chapter 5. You see where I, I underlined too little to be among the clans of Judah. So it was known as a little insignificant town. And it became that again by the time of Jesus. This is a little no-name kind of place in the time of Jesus. No one thought much of Bethlehem. Remember the story of Samuel anointing David? Remember I mentioned that from 1 Samuel 16? Well, when Samuel goes to, he gets to Bethlehem, the elders of Bethlehem, the small town, it's a small town, so whenever there's big news, everybody knows. And so when the prophet Samuel comes, the one who anointed Saul, the one who had judged Israel for many years, when he shows up in Bethlehem, everyone finds out it's like wildfire goes through the town. And so the elders go to him. And they're trembling. And they say, do you come in peace? Why are they afraid? It's a man of God. Why should they fear? Well, here's why they're afraid. Because, uh, because big name prophets, the primary judge of Israel, the anointer of kings, doesn't go to places like Bethlehem. Big name prophets go to places like New York City or L.A. or Chicago. They don't go to Bethlehem. This is nowhere land. It's a, it's a nothing town. If you travel and someone asks you where you're from and you say Bethlehem, they say, where's that? And then you say, oh, yeah, well, it's, it's just south of Jerusalem. And they say, oh, okay, I know where Jerusalem's at. And that's how they locate you. And what does this show us? Does God just simply like surprises? Well, we know that God uses the weak to defeat the strong so that no one can boast. And when you look at that idea that Jesus comes from this no-name place, this weak place, it's not even a fortress, it's, it's barely acknowledged. When you realize that, isn't that a picture of the gospel? Because how are we saved? How do we overcome? Is it that our king let us, came and let us out as a mighty army and defeated all the, the, the armies of the world that were in rebellion against God? No. It's that he came as a baby in a no-name place and he died on a cross at the hands of rebellious humanity. Because when we are weak, God is strong. Why? Why does God do it like that? So that no one can boast about their might. So that no one can say, I came to God in my strength. No, you can't say that. Not when your Savior had to die on a cross. That's why Paul says, let's glory in our weaknesses. So that he can be shown to be strong. Yes, I am limited. I, I am weak. I, I need forgiveness. I need mercy. I need patience. It's good for me to acknowledge that. That's why humility is so critical to the Christian life. Because it shows how strong God is in saving us through Christ Jesus on the cross. Well, that's a big part of what's happening in Christ being born in Bethlehem. There's many ways that, that Bethlehem is kind of, it points to justification. Justification by grace through faith in Christ. But like everything else about our Lord, being born in such a humble place teaches us also that he, he comes in the form of a servant. You know, he's not born in the palace just up the road in Jerusalem. I mean, does God have, you know, bad target practice? Like, there's Jerusalem right there. It's like, 
you know, God, shouldn't the king be born there? Oh, I missed. It's a few miles south in a little place. No, God did it on purpose. And he's born in this little place, not born in the palace. He's not born in any significant city in the world at the time, not Rome, not Babylon, not Corinth, not Cairo, not Jerusalem. He's born in a town of hundreds, a small, insignificant place to teach us what he would be like. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Remember when Jesus washed the disciples' feet? He took the form of a servant so that they could understand what he was doing. They, They knew he was their master and Lord. But he took the form of the the lowest slave and washed the dust off their feet so that they could understand that this is what he was doing for them by becoming human, by living this life, by going to the cross. He was serving them to the uttermost. And he wanted them to understand that he was serving them, and he wanted them to understand that this is his stance toward the world, and he wanted them to understand that by in following him, by being his disciples, by being in him, to demonstrate who he is, to let people know what his nature is like, to glorify him on this earth, to proclaim him here, to shine him forth, they would need to take the same stance that he took, and that was of a servant. And that's why he's born in that place. Little, insignificant, nowhere town, the little town of Bethlehem. Jesus goes far further than washing our feet. He dies for us. And is it not now time for us to pick up our cross this Christmas season, to die to ourselves and to follow him? When do we humble ourselves, brothers and sisters, if not now? in light of the incarnation, in light of God becoming man, in light of what we find when we go to the little town of Bethlehem. The time has come for God's people, for Crossway Church, the members here, to humble ourselves so that Christ can be exalted in our midst. This is the kind of Lord He is. He is humble. Let me give you a contrast. Take Islam, for instance. Islam cannot abide the scandal of the idea of incarnation. It's scandalous to them. It's it's blasphemy. It is blasphemy to Islam to assert that God came as a lowly human. And, 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 And in their eyes, God is only strong. He only rules. He cannot. He would not. He would never come as a human being. He would never stoop to become part of his creation. He would never stoop to take on the form of flesh. He would never actually become part of this creation, even though humanity is the highest part of this creation. It's still too low, and in their eyes it's scandalous, it's disgusting, it's filthy, it's blasphemy. And they're right. It is scandalous. But that's exactly what God does. And why does He do it? He does it in love for us. He lowers Himself. The Son of God becomes man, born as a baby in Bethlehem, so that He can serve us all the way to the cross and then the resurrection and His ascension. It's this very truth that should grip and shape us and transform us, that our Lord came as a humble servant. He came in lowly way, in lowly circumstance, to a lowly place, and served and served and served and served until he gives his very life away so that you and I could be served salvation in our place, condemned he stood. I think the Lord wants to teach us more humility this Christmas And it's a perfect time. It's a perfect time because that's the kind of Lord He is. I think, think, by the way, gift-giving is a great mechanism 
to develop humility. Because when you give gifts, you're, you're thinking about someone else. At least you're supposed to be, right? You're thinking about them. You're not thinking just about how much joy you'll get from giving them. You're, you're actually wanting to bless them. And so you're thinking, what would bless them? Let me try and give that to them. And there's thought that goes into it, and energy that goes in, and resource that goes into it. That's a glorious thing about gift giving. That's, God gave us the greatest gift, so we give gifts to one another. And when we give gifts rightly, it's a great mechanism for humility. Because you're, you're not looking to bless yourself, you're looking to bless others. And so, let me ask, are you more excited about what you're going to give this year or what you're going to get this year? Let your excitement be about what you're going to give this year. And we can serve those that the Lord has placed around us. We can give to them, not just in gifts, but of ourselves, to our family and our friends, our family. Some of us have experienced great rifts in family and to our friends and to our neighbors, and to our co-workers, and to our brothers and sisters here. We can demonstrate the very love of God at Christmas time that we have come to know because of Christmas. Find Jesus in Bethlehem, 